Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for choosing to worship with us here at Roser Church, here in person and online. We are so privileged to have you here. You know, I was thinking this week about some things that happened in my past, particularly about the doctoral program that I was a part of. I entered my graduate program for a PhD in theology in the spring of 1983, or in the fall of 1983. And I graduated in the spring of 1991. <laughs> Almost eight full years it took me to get my PhD in theology. Now, most of that time was five years working on a dissertation. And it took me that long because, well, quite frankly, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. You know what I'm saying? There are a number of things that happened. Life became an issue. But I got to tell you, there are many times through that long stretch where I was kind of sitting alone in my cubicle trying to read Latin or French or German and the article just scrambling, just wondering. And, you know, five days and you write two pages and throw them both away, you know. And it's just you, you wondered sometime during that process, is this worth it? Like, is this worth it? Am I cut out for this? Should I go find something else to do with my life? Because I'm not sure how this is going to work. But I just kept going one day after another, and eventually graduation day came, and it was so jubilant. It was so wonderful after all that time. And yes, my poor wife had to go through every single day with that with me. Every day wondering how many pages I got done today, right? All, all that period. Would it ever happen? In fact, somewhere we have a picture of her wearing my cap and gown and holding the diploma because like, she deserved this as much as I did. Sometimes life can be that way. We have goals, we have aspirations, we have hopes, and we work at them, but they just take so long, and the, the journey from here to there is just so painful. Just so many times where just getting there can be discouraging. How do you keep going when you want to give up? We've been working through Paul's letter to the Romans, especially uh, Romans chapter 8, this wonderful chapter where he kind of lands his theology on the ground about how it's meant to encourage us, how we are to find motivation and, and inspiration to keep living through these difficult times. What benefits do we have in following Christ that gives us this inspiration to do things we can't otherwise do? And it has a lot to do with the Spirit of God. And so this week, as we walk through this argument, he's going to be talking about this journey, this journey of life that gets difficult sometimes. He talks about it in verse 23. Look what he says. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. He's picking up an image that he introduced last week. If you were here last week, I encourage you to go on our YouTube channel, watch it. it he, Paul introduces this image of groaning as kind of like childbirth. And last week it was the groaning of the world and how difficult the world is going through these challenging times and how difficult that can be and the pains and the cries and the groans. And Paul is challenging us to see those as a childbirthing pain. They're just waiting for the children of God to be revealed. God brought his children in the world to do something about that, and the world is just groaning, just wanting those children to just come out. <laughs> and now he's taking that image and making it personal. When we have that, our own groaning, when we're feeling pain, he wants us to see it as a childbirthing groan, that there's something we just want to come out of us. We just want to get to the end. Now, we don't feel it all day, every day. Some days we experience joy. Paul calls this the first fruits of the Spirit. When we come to Christ, we follow Christ, we, we receive joy, we receive hope, we feel like we're part of a community. We, we have a lot of blessing. So we're experiencing these first fruits. But there are other days where it just hurts. It just hurts. It hurts to follow God. It hurts to follow Christ. It hurts to live. Hurts physically, I'm learning that as I get older. Now I groan just getting out of a chair. You know what I mean? There's, like, there's groaning that comes just simple things like that. 
But it goes deeper. We have many groans. We lose somebody, a relationship that breaks up, financial plan that didn't work out. And there's this groaning that comes from deep within our soul. It's part of our journey. And Paul's encouraging us to think about those groans as birth pains because this is going somewhere. This is taking us somewhere. This is preparing us for a destiny. And he describes that destiny as the redemption of our bodies. Redemption is another one of those theology words that can confuse us, but it doesn't have to. It basically means he reclaims our bodies for what they were intended. Reclaims our bodies. God did not create bodies to do what they do. He did not create people to be as messed up as they are. That's not what he created. And so God is acting through Christ to reclaim all that. That's his. To create human beings the way he wants them to be, including their bodies. That's the destiny. Your body is going to be reclaimed. And we know that. That's the destiny because of what happened to Jesus. Jesus lived in a broken body, a body that was persecuted, a body that suffered relationships that are broken, injustice of the world. He experienced all that, but God rose him up again from the dead. Even death could not conquer him. He had into a glorious new body. And he did all that for one reason to tell us all that that's our destiny, that's our future, that's our inheritance as children of God. These broken bodies, this messed up lives that we're living, this is not the end of our story. No, that's the end of our story, the resurrected body of Jesus, which is why when I talk about Easter, it's not just a resurrection of the spirit or a resurrection of the soul. It is a resurrection of the body. God promises us that we will be fully reclaimed, fully adopted. That's where this is going. So while we're going through the struggles and while we're having the hard times and while we're groaning, he wants us to remember in our head that this is going somewhere. That this is not the end of our story. Just keep going. Just keep going because there's an end game. And last week we learned that the reason we're in this end game is because there's a world out there that doesn't know about the glory of God. And so in our broken bodies, while we're suffering, God is working through them, and he's asking us to keep going because the world's looking to see where is the gracious God in all this? Where's the loving God in all this? It's part of this desire for us to get from here to there. So in the midst of our struggle, we don't have to give up and give in and feel lost because God is birthing something through us. It is this reclamation of our bodies, reclamation of who we are as human beings as he made us from all eternity. That's the promise that's out there. And we live with this hope. This hope should empower us through this journey. He talks about the hope in verse 24. He says, For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Hope is one of the most powerful emotions we can have in our life. Hope is incredibly powerful. It is what keeps us going when we want to give up. We have this feeling inside of us, this hope inside of us says that the better is ahead. The best is yet to come. It gives us motivation to keep going because we know it's going to get better. That is such a powerful, powerful force to help us sustain. But hope is also fragile. It's very fragile because of the person in whom or the thing in which we hope. It's hard for us to hope sometimes, especially those that have been around for a while, because our hope has been disappointed over and over again. We hoped to get better. We hoped for a better job. We hoped for a promotion. We hoped for our finances to get better. We hoped for this relationship to work out. We hoped our child would do what we want our child to do. We've had all kinds of hopes. But those hopes have not come true. And that disappointment, it makes hope fragile, and then we're just even more crushed. 
And over years, if we've hoped over and over again, we can give up. We can become cynical and hard, and then our suffering is just suffering. It's not going anywhere. We have no choice. But Paul is saying this hope is different. This is not a hope in which you are going to be disappointed. We know that for a fact because Jesus came back from the dead. That's a certainty. That's a proof that God can do just that, that this is not the end of our story. So that hope has been proven for us. We do not have to give in on that hope. But sometimes we act like we don't have that hope because we get in the middle of our suffering like, Ooh, woe is me, man, I don't know where God is in all this. God must be out of town. He's saying, do you remember the hope? Do you remember that this is not the end of the story? Now, he understands our pain and our suffering, but how quickly when we're in the middle of the journey do we forget about the destination, about the fact that God is taking us somewhere? That hope is supposed to empower us. Because here's what happens. If he gives you the answer, he gives you everything, then, like, how quickly would you stop forget, thinking about God? Everything's going great. Everything, we, we, we don't need anything. We have a great life. It's one of the problems with trying to share Christ in this kind of more wealthy environment because everybody's like, who needs God? I got a $6 million house on my own power. Who needs God? There's no groaning. Until, of course, your family falls apart or your finances fall apart or your body falls apart, and then you're like, yeah, I guess I do need God after all. Paul is saying, listen, while you're groaning, that's a reminder that there's a hope. There's a destiny. There's somewhere that he's taking us. But there's another reason why we're in the middle of this, because we're on a journey. We, we don't see it yet. But he wants us to know that journey from here to there, it's going to take some time. It's going to require resilience, our resilience. I went through all this hope of becoming a professor in a theology school, did all this work, and then it turns out I couldn't get a theology job. I had a hope that was disappointed. So I ended up in the IT world. And I learned something in the IT world that the resilient usually win. <laughs> you just keep going. There'll be critics, there'll be complaints, there'll be people pushing back, there'll be objections, there'll be hardships, there'll be challenges, nothing will make sense. You just keep going. Every day you get up, you go to work, you solve the problem, you just keep going. You keep your head down, you don't make trouble, you try to get along as best you can, you just keep going. And often through my career, I saw people going in and out the door, but somehow I was still sitting there because I was just resilient. Didn't always work that way, but I learned that principle, resilient. The resilient usually win. Just stay at it. Paul is telling us, your resilience in life matters. Just keep going. Just keep going because this hope is sure and certain. You're going to get there. It just requires some resilience, what he calls patience. But we don't like the word patience because it's annoying. We want it now, right? So let me call it resilience. It's that willingness to say, I don't need it right now. I'm on a journey here. I just need to keep going because God is working through me. And here's the reality. If I didn't go off into the IT world, there'd be all kinds of people I never met, all kinds of experiences I wouldn't have, money that I have that I would never had as a professor. I'm just saying God works through all those experiences to touch other people in our lives so we can be confident that God is working through that. We just need, our part is to be resilient, not give in, not give up. But still, there are those moments when you feel like you're out there all alone. When I'm sitting in my cubicle trying to read German or Latin or French, and it makes no sense to me. I'm like, why do I keep going? We need to be reminded that we're not in this by ourselves. God gives us guides, and not just any guides. He gives us himself. You know, as I was going through my doctoral process during that dissertation, there were four lovely gentlemen, and they were gentlemen, each one of them. 
that were my dissertation advisors, and they were amazing. They were just smart as a whip and kind and, and wise and thoughtful. One of them I went to visit in Paris. He took me around. They're just, he and his wife, just amazing people. And I will tell you, I would not have gotten through even five years were it not for these gentlemen. Now, any one of them could have done what I did five times better in like a third of the time, right? Like that's just, that's how smart they are. But they knew not just what I had to accomplish, they knew me, my weaknesses, my challenge, my struggles, and they were the ones kind of appointed together to get me through that journal from here, journey from here to there. Well, what Paul is telling us next is that we all have that kind of advisory committee in our life. It's a divine guide that is there with us. Look what he says in verse 26. He says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not yet know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless A lot of interpreters have taken a whack at trying to interpret this verse, but can I just say what I think it means in plain language? When we're groaning and life becomes so difficult that sometimes we can't even find the words. Have you ever groaned to that point? You just don't even know what to say. It's just so painful and so broken, you don't even know what to say. Someone passes away and you're like, I, I don't, this is just so devastating, I can't even speak. Sometimes the tears don't even, I'm out of tears. What Paul is saying is in those moments of groaning, do you understand that there's Spirit of God there in your life who can speak for you even if you can't speak for yourself? And what he's saying to you is the Spirit understands your groaning. The Spirit understands your groaning. He knows what's at the heart. There's a Spirit of God that goes with you through the struggle. You're never alone in the struggle. This is the Spirit of God that knows us intimately. And so when we go through these times and we go to God and we're yelling at Him, arguing with Him, or maybe we're saying nothing at all, He wants us to be assured that there is this presence of God within us that the Spirit knows exactly what's going on, why we are groaning, what's roots behind it, so that we're never alone. There's always a guide with you, helping you work through this problem, helping you know what to say and to think and and how to give us a perspective that will enable us to keep going even though the pain is more than we can bear. But there's another level to that guidance. That spirit now has a conversation with the Father. Look what happens in verse 27. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. I think this is talking about the Father here. In a way, Paul is presenting an image to us that the Father and Spirit are having a conversation about you, about us, each one of us. During my doctoral process, I don't know how many times they had to meet and say, what are we going to do about this guy? Oh my gosh, it's taken him five weeks. What are we going to do to get him from here to there? Anybody have any ideas? Let's whiteboard this thing, because it seems like a lost cause. Let's try to get some ideas. Paul is giving us an image here. Whatever this means in the infinite mind of God and his eternity, we don't know. This is beyond our ability to understand. So Paul gives it to us in an image we'll understand. What he's saying to you is the Spirit and the Father are having a conversation about you. Right now. While you're going through this, the Spirit of God is interceding with the Father and saying, Hey, what are we going to do about Dirk, man? He has such an issue right now. How are we going to get through this? How are we going to, how are we going to get him from here to there? We know his destiny. He, he knows his destiny, but man, he is stuck. How are we going to get him from here to there? There's a meeting going on right now. But take this to another level. Do you realize there's a meeting going on for each one of us all over the world? Billions and billions of people. God is having a simultaneous meeting right now about you and about you and about you and about you. I don't even know, I can't begin to think about how that works. How do you manage all that? I can't even remember what day garbage day is. That's my life, you know what I mean? Here's God managing all of these conversations. So that's the sovereign power of God. That's the kind of God we serve. That's what Paul's saying. Do you understand that 
God is somehow going through all these things, and he's got to manage this for the sovereign will of God, because in the end, the world has to be restored in his image, the image of his son. He has to put it back to the way it's supposed to be from the beginning. God is working this master plan with a thousand of lives going hither and there, groaning, filled with pain. God is there having meetings about every single one of them, exactly where they are in life. And Paul says, you need to know that the advisor is on your team. He's on the job. You're not like he's too busy to worry about you. The Spirit of God is leading you on the journey. You have that guide. So what's the point? To me, it's a pretty simple point, actually. Paul is making here. He's reminding us that our God is our constant and caring guide. That God you worship, the one who saved us, like he didn't just like put us in a category and then take off to work on the next person. No, he, he's involved in our life every single day, getting us from here to there, even through our groaning. Earlier I told you in the children's sermon about our trip to Africa and the guides we had there. If you didn't see that, if you're watching online, you skip that part, go back and watch it again. We had these wonderful guides in this safari in Africa. But the part I didn't tell you is that somewhere along the line, my wife decided she could do that job. I mean, there were two guides. One of those guys, since he was two, he's been out there in the bush. Like, he knows all the places, all the animals. He knows how to smell the wind and which way to look and all that stuff. And in, in that culture, they sit on the front of the Jeep. There's a chair that there's no seatbelt or anything. You just sit up there. Well, Liz told the guys, I can do that job. It doesn't look that hard. All you do is sit in the front and look for stuff. So it's Africa, so they put her on the front of the Jeep, like in a chair. No belt or anything. You just get on it. And sure enough, as soon as she got in the chair, we made a right-hand turn up a little hill around, and there's this big giraffe standing there. And she said, see, it wasn't that hard. It's pretty easy. See, sometimes we get like that in life, right? We have the first fruits of the Spirit. We think everything's fine. We don't, we don't need a guide until you need a guide. <laughs> then you realize somebody better know what they're doing. Somebody better know the lay of the land. Somebody better know me. And Paul is saying that's what we have every day. So where do we go from here? What's, what's our next step? I think it's very simply, uh, allow God to inspire your journey this week. Your journey may be filled with some groans. There may be hardships. You may want to give in and give up. Well, remember, we have an inheritance. We have a destiny, a sure and certain one, a hope that God guarantees with the death and resurrection of his own son. Allow that to inspire our journey to keep going. God's God's will, it's still happening even if we don't understand it. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this encouragement from your word. That each of us, we have those guides in our life that can lead us through the jungles of life and all the despair of life until we receive the fullness of everything you've promised to us. Grant us this encouragement. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen.